this example is like Lukas, where this worked out perfectly, right? So he had built up his uh, Team Europe ecosystem, where we were also part of, right? And then he figured out that he discovered a unicorn along the way, right? Which is now an Israel delivery hero, right? And what the only thing that made a lot of sense for him at that time was to shut down everything left and right, you know, to seize every you know marketing department that he had, to stop doing uh, portfolio companies left and right. He had discovered this one company and then concentrate on this one asset. This was his outlet, right? So you, you also have to be very adaptive in your strategy and, and shift, you know, because the whole ecosystem, as I already said, you know, is just so early and, uh, and, and, and corporates are now trying to play a huge role, right? As uh, the panel beforehand uh, discussed. And, and this is all super complex, right? And, uh, you know, more or less almost on a daily basis, you're shifting uh, around in your strategy. The great thing, and uh, which is probably also why, is there is a trend towards more <coughs> operational venture capital or people that are very involved with this. Um, because if you have done this several times before, and if your teams have done their functions several times before, you can give such a high leverage to an operationally smart, highly driven team in just avoiding some certain pitfalls and in just handing out what you have basically in your desk, which costs you an hour, which would, could take weeks or so to structure, for example, just a great uh, incentivization program for your, for your team, so, so which is just there, and it, it's only in the desk. And I think you have, can have such a high value creation with it that basically, in the end, you are much more attractive to the right teams if you provide this value, which in, in the essence gives you access to the best talent which is still by far the most important success factor, especially when it's in the early stages of, uh, of companies. It's yeah. interesting, we think so too. That's why what you have, you have a certain type of founder who wants that. Mm -hmm. So we, we're really looking carefully at these skills, hard skills of the founders, but also we try to understand if, if they're willing to interact with us. So if they're not willing to interact, then it's great that we all have something in the desk that we can pull out, pull out and, and give to them. If they're not willing to take it, it's just nonsense. Yeah, so coachability. Then, then if you, yeah, coachability sounds a little bit from up to down. So this is, it's, I don't like this too much, but the, talking to people in an, uh, in an open discussion. When we did Kajan, for example, we had this, like there were several discussions that we had where we were wrong, yeah, and they were right, and said, yeah, maybe you're right, so we follow your position. But want to be able to enter in an open discussion. Tell them, hey, we have done an ESOP before, maybe you take it. You can, of course, go to a lawyer and do it again and spend another 15,000 euros, no problem. Or you take this. So and then, then so it's important to have the right founders who are willing to, to take this. Yeah. Which is not easy. I mean, I, you know, we try to do this we're super early, super, you know, but that's our credo because for three months we really try to add value. We hire all these entrepreneurs and residents and we actually spend a lot of money on testing the psychological analysis of the team, the compatibility, the coachability, or whatever you want to call it, because if they're not going to be willing to, uh, to listen, then what's the point, right? That's how it works. But let me, um, let me try to find a dark side of all of this. Um, these, uh, obviously, all of the services that you offer, it has to reflect somehow on the cap table for the founders. So I know it's tough to, to, to go across the board, but can you give us an indication of where you would maybe take way more equity than another investor that would only invest the cash without the services. Just to give me a, or the audience a feeling of, of where the difference is. Yeah, maybe I start. Uh, it's completely transparent. It's, you can all look it up on our website. Um, we take 25% on our investment share, mm -hmm. uh, which is the only investment share that we take in the company. Um, then we take uh, on discretionary basis up to 10, 20 percent. Uh, additionally, co-founding shares um, more or less at uh, the foundation of every company, right? So we go to the notary together and start the first GMBH. And the 10 to 20 percent co-founding share aligns us 100 percent with the co-founder. So anytime any future financing starts, um, we dilute just the same way as the founders would dilute, and that's why we also refer to this share as being the co-founding share of every company. So our maximum cap table is 45%. On average, we're roughly at 40, um, uh, which, which means the remainder uh, after our cash injection of a quarter of a million is roughly at 60% for the founding team. 
And this is something that we have tested out with a lot of uh, larger uh, family offices and VCs and, and future financing rounds. Uh, and uh, for instance, Schutzklick was created in exactly this way. And we were um, very happy to attract now over 30 million in, in venture capital with that from now. So it does stick with uh, even larger uh, VC investments. So we clearly separate between equity and the services. So we basically, this is where we operational and VC. The VC part is we invest money and we get, for the cash, we get equity. We never get any equity for work or sweat equity or anything. So it's basically uh, um, money, equity, and this is also what we, what incentivizes us as, as, a, as partners uh, the, the, to actually m um, multiply that, uh, th those equities. The services part is, is a different entity and we, and we charge the companies for these services. We charge them at cost or most of the time below. So for us, this is a total cost center. We basically, uh, we cover around 60% of our costs of the 100 people that we employ uh, by charging the companies. And, but this is being subsidized by our investors, by our limited partners who we were able to convince of this model um, of the, uh, that, that we actually say, okay, if you, we, we will actually deploy your money in a better manner. First, we get into the best deal because we position ourselves right. And second, uh, we believe that we, we build a very much more sustainable and healthy infrastructure in these early stages for the companies. So we, we, will, we will produce better companies for you, but you give us a bit, a bit of a higher management fee. So the management fee is just is, is a top up of Normally it's always 2% of the fund size per year is management fee, that's the standard. And we, we can go up to 3%, but we're like between 2.5 or 2.6 or 2.7. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's, it's uh, the, 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 the LPs have agreed uh, on that. So this is, it's basically a subsidized model, but it's for us, it's a total cost center. And we are, we are actually, we're not incentivized at all. It's, it's rather the opposite make money with that operation platform. So it's really, the operation platform is really just basically a goodie uh, for, for the companies and we are only incentivized to make money on the equity side. Um, yeah, in the companies uh, that we co-found, uh, the stake can range between 10% and 85% that we have. And it all depends on basically who brings uh, what to the table at what stage is, for example, we only have maybe a great idea and a team member and the rest comes from outside, then uh, it could be very low um, on the other side and we will typically still uh, invest always at least uh, six figures from the beginning. If in cases where, for example, such as Solaris Bank, we kind of committed an eight-digit amount from day one and had uh, our whole or a very large team working 12 months on getting the license then we obviously are on the higher stake of uh, the site. And so it's always about finding the right balance for, uh, for, uh, for the venture. And then regarding to the cost of uh, the step, so we are also subsidizing this, which basically means every year our holding makes a loss through those um, uh, people that we employ <coughs> to support the companies, which we are happy to take in order to make the companies better. And so our upside and uh, even covering part of the cost all comes through the basically equity and uh, so that we are also highly aligned with the companies that we pay. What do you think are the, is the most important trait of an entrepreneur that you find where you're like, I've got to invest in this guy? What, what, what is it? What is, is it the technology? Is it more of the, what attributes or what skills? Is it depends on the company. How much yeah. time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question, actually, Daniel. How much time do we have? <laughs> 10 minutes? Ten minutes? Because I also want to open up uh, questions to the audience. Um. For us, it's the, we have to believe the vision that they, we have to believe in their vision. So if they come to us and tell us in five years it's this and this, and we don't believe it, then we don't invest. If you think, ah, oh, that's cool. If this would work out, that would be great. Then we invest in it. So we ask, based on this, we ask three questions. First one is, what's the real market problem that you're addressing? So we have to understand and address the market problem. Second one is, how is the product solving this market problem? Yeah, that's the easier question already. The third one is, is the team able to bring one and two together? So this is mostly the case. 
most difficult question is question number one. What's the real market problem that you're addressing? And the most founders, about 80%, fail in the pitch with this question. We, we looked a little bit different to it. Actually, I don't care so much about, let's say, the current view somebody has on the market. We just want to have extraordinary strong people who are extremely determined to making this company a success and uh, who can back it up. And then in terms of the view on the market, I think we can quickly align ourselves on it and quickly find that. So I think that's not the most critical question. Which is what yeah. you guys have said as well, right? Yeah, you don't really care I, about I the think, market. yeah, because I, I really think we made an analysis on, on, the, on the approach to fail in a way. And well, we had difficulties and, and 80% uh, the reason was the team. The simple step. I mean, it is, um, and the, the good exits that we had, we had one pivot, two pivots sometimes, and, and really changed completely the strategy product and market approach. So, most important is what I think you said in the beginning if you sit together and the DNA is it okay? Is, is the team passionate about what they do? Do they fit to each other? And also, it's cheesy always to say that, that the team is the most important. But it is true, and you can feel it. You can feel it very quickly. On, you know, are they are they going to succeed? And maybe just to add on that, um, uh, it's the sparkle in the eye. Yeah, definitely. That's something more magical, almost sometimes attached to it. But then, um, a grade A founder is very imperative. Not a double or triple A, right? But just someone A, because. A might actually hire a double A to do the CFO in two years time or a triple A to be the COO in a year's time or something like that. But whereas if you have a B type of founder, he or she will attract C, D and E and F level, right? You know, that's the, the main problem that you that you then are, are, are left with. Um, so that's and then our you sit in boardrooms with follow on funding VCs and you have to basically spend sixty percent of your time talking Coach about them. How are you going to fire the CEO? Right? Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it's terrible. I'm sorry, guys. That's, 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 that's the worst part of it. Um, since we have 10 minutes, 5 minutes, um, I'd love to maybe open up the uh, questions to the audience. Is there anybody in here that wants to ask questions? Please, go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> um, as it sounds so much you're involved with the uh, founders, um, uh, how, how do you guys give freedom of choice to the founders or how the playground looks like? Is it like, how, uh, let me put it this way, um, do you guys ever face any control oriented founders who really believed in this vision that nobody else believed and you guys were against it and then by force or by whatever means they could do it and then later you found out that you were wrong? So have you faced something? If you have not faced, if you face someone like that, what would be your reaction? I, I think Henry answered it earlier, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's a very important question. I think that's, that's a big fear all the founders have when, you, when, you, when it comes to operational VCs. Um, for us, we try to avoid that already structurally because we, like, because we only own we see typical VC stakes. It's like we own, like when we invest, we own between 15, 20%. So we, we don't have a controlling stake. Meaning that we are also like, structurally we are not able to force our companies to take our services. And they can, they are totally in the driver's seat. They can, like it's all, all, all our services are like on demand. It's like a menu in the restaurant and they can choose. They can take, they can, they can use this for one day, they can use this for six months. And that's the, the it's, it's, it's basically on demand. And this is very important to us because we know that there have been other companies, and I'm not talking about these guys, guys uh, in the past, that have basically forced or pushed their services to the companies and, and also in the end made, uh, made money uh, uh, this way. Uh, and I think this is, this is, this is terrifying for, for many companies. So we make very clear that this is on demand and it's the, 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 the founders in the, in, dri in the driver's seat, and we are there to support. And not uh, and not to basically take over. So maybe as it's really quickly same here, and I didn't uh, answer this cap table question. Um, so Speed Invest also takes maximum fifteen percent in the beginning, um, and the equity part for the for the work or the operations that that we offer 
a set is callable. So it's it's on at the end it's on the on the founder to decide yes I want more involvement or less involvement and dependent on that we keep the equity or not. Um, so and and why we take so little equity because it's very easy in the beginning you know to take much more, but uh, there comes many follow-on rounds potentially. And uh, if founders are not in the driver's seat and don't have the majority, they lose their appetite. And mm -hmm. uh, it should be important. Related to that, uh, I think with very smart founders, <coughs> it has barely been the case that after a good discussion around the topic, there was a controversial view if it's left or right. And in doubt, as long as we believe in the founder and that they are smart, capable people, we basically let them take the decision. <laughs> Only if we would completely disagree that somebody is probably or not the right person to lead a company, then we would probably rather discuss uh, that. But other than that, let the founders make the decision. We are there with the platform, support, stay in the background, and if it goes extremely well, then they deserve all the credit. Yeah. Uh, how open are you for uh, startups from another country or founders from another country? Europe. Mm -hmm. Let's give an example. I am concentrating on Indian market, 